This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Ting. So, Emil, what inspired you to get yourself a hot injection? <laughs> well, uh, really, it was, uh, you know, 2005, and uh, I was working at uh, a medical clinic doing consulting for IT, and, and I started getting other clinics in the area and just started amassing this giant uh, jailer's key ring, uh, and it was pretty ridiculous. So uh, my office door was a crash bar door. It locked automatically, and I was always carrying heavy things in and out. I'm like, God, there's got to be a better way to – I wish the door just knew that it was me. And uh, so I thought about it real quick, and I said, okay, well, biometrics is perfect, right? It could just kind of see me coming or, like, some easy way to know that it's me. But um, it was then and still is uh, kind of clunky. It's expensive, difficult to implement, and, you know, kind of vulnerable to vandalism. So I thought, well, RFID. That's cheap, fast, reliable, uh, easy to implement, and, is, you know, pretty resilient. So uh, I still wanted to have some way to not have to carry the card. And so I thought, oh, animals, you know, pets have been getting these things. Is there anything available? So I just do a bunch of research and, you know, was, long story short, I found found a, a vendor that actually had a, a what's called an EM4102 uh, uh, type tag. And uh, there's a lot of cheap gear to read it. And I thought, awesome. So I ordered some tags, ordered some gear, already had the thing built when the tags arrived and I had all these doctors as clients. So I'm like, hey, doctors, let's do this. And they said, sure. So I had it in and, uh, you know, access control working. And then I thought about it. I'm like, wow, that's kind of that's kind of not normal. Right. So yeah. I, so I just sent some pictures to some friends said, hey, you know, here, you know, <clears throat> go check this out. And, and uh, they, they were like, whoa, what the hell? What'd you do? And some of them put it on like boing boing and slash dot. And then it just exploded. Do you, do you get called like a cyborg? I get called a lot of things. I, I, I do get called a cyborg. I kind of don't agree with that. I think somebody with a pacemaker is much more cybernetic or a cochlear implant, um, way more cybernetic than me, which is I just moved the RFID tag from a pants pocket to a skin pocket. So tell me about the, the bio side of it. What does this, what does the, the human do when you start injecting technology in? Well, uh, you know, because it doesn't really interact with my body, I, I would love if there was some way to like have a sensor on it where it could like report my temperature or, you know, hello, Emil, you've got a temp uh, fever, you know, when I come home um, or like, you know, glucose test or uric acid or whatever, some, some kind of interactive thing. But right now, I mean, the utility of it for me is simple ask access control and that's all I ever wanted it for. Uh, and it works great for that. Like, you know, log into the computer, start the car, start the motorcycle, you know, get in my door. It's awesome. Fire safe. I have a fire safe that I can get into pretty easily okay as a fellow rider i have to know how do you wire the mo motorcycle um that was actually pretty easy i just um you know i looked at the schematic in the manual and i said okay when i turn the key three pairs of wires are you know connected and so i just got three automotive relays and then a fourth that kind of is a self-latching relay so and a cheap reader kit that i have a bunch here today and you know just um you know reads the tag says yep that id is in my authorized list kicks out a 12 volt signal that the, uh, the relay latches, it latches all the other relays, and it's as if I had turned the key. And the important thing about that is to note that it's an additional authentication method, not a replacement for the key. So you can still use the key, or you can use RFID. And I think that's so, you, so you have to put the key into, you know, you got to turn the, the motorcycle on, and then it just basically turns it over for you. No, no, it's actually, a, uh, it's not a two-factor authentication, it's an alternative to the key. So if I don't have the key, I can just scan, and it'll act as if that I turn the key. And so then I can, you know, crank over the engine and it'll start up and go. If I don't present the tag and I don't have an, a key, it'll crank over, but it won't start. So I could use the key or the tag. Tell me about the actual attack of it. Is it like public key encryption or using like a symmetric key? Is there like a, um, is there a challenge in response to it? Uh, a lot of automotive keys use a Texas instrument that does have a challenge response, but um, my whole thing was like cheap and easy. So the uh, the tag that I have is an EM4102 and the gear is super cheap and there's no, there's no cryptology to it at all. It's just literally it'll respond with its ID to any reader that inquires, you know, about it. So um, I, I consider the privacy and security issues around it and really it came down to, for me anyway, and for a lot of people, use case. Mm -hmm. So in a private use case, um, let's say you're a ra attackers are typically random, right? You don't really know exactly who you're attacking. You just kind of attack whatever's available. You know, people port scan and they, you know, try, and the people are trying to RF scan people's uh, credit cards when they walk by. But and those are random attacks. So for me, the personal use case, 
I've bre- I've built everything that I have. Um, it's not a business use case or anything like that. So it's not widely known what this number does. So if you were to get the number that I have and not know anything about me, it's a number. It's useless to you. You don't know what it does or that it, even that it's a key to anything. So uh, on the inverse, if you you know scan somebody's credit card, um, you know with an RF enabled credit card, you know immediately what to do. You don't have to know them. So that's the difference between a personal use and a business use case. Um, and I'm not I'm not too scared of a personal use security issue because <clears throat> if somebody knew me and wanted to get into my house or something like that, um, then they, they're going to do it, right? They're going to break a window or whatever. This is, you know, scanning my RF tag and emulating it would be overkill. For- but, but you're not worried about, like, the feds, like, just shaking your hands and in the process of, like, gripping your hand, cloning your, uh, your key? Um, that's possible. I'm not afraid that the feds are going to do that. I mean, I'm not doing anything that would you know, invite their wrath. But, uh, and you know, some people think that there's some way to track the chip around. It really just has a one or two inch read range. Um, it's theoretically possible to build like a giant coil, uh, like maybe in a doorway or something that you could, you know, put so that when people walk through or when I walk through, uh, it would read the tag and then they would know he was here at this time and date. But that's really, I mean, it's a really expensive and ridiculous thing, especially when a biometric solution like a face rec camera would be much easier and cheaper to deploy nowadays. Well, can you show me the technology, how this works? Sure. So um, in my uh, left hand, I just have the EM4102. It's a low frequency, 125 kilohertz tag. Um, in my right hand, I had a Philips High tag, which is 134 kilohertz. Um, and it had some crypto security features, like a 40-bit uh, challenge response key and some data storage. But I found my right hand's kind of my project hand. I really didn't find much use for the High tag. Um, and the gear is more expensive and everything. So I had it removed and uh, actually contacted a company to custom build a tag that's in the high frequency range, which is 13.56 megahertz. Um, so I had one of those tags made, and it's actually kind of cool because you can uh, interface it with NFC. So this is your phone here, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and scan it if I can get it to the, the battery that's built into this uh, phone has NFC you know, antenna built into the battery, which is kind of, at times, depending on the manufacturer, it's not very reliable. It's great until you get third-party batteries, and then they don't have that. Well, actually, I did buy a third-party battery, and it, it has a better one, so I'm going to use my phone. Okay. So I've even got a big old you know case around it, and uh, it works pretty well. So I, I have an application made by a company called NXP, and it's just called Tag Info, and it, just, it does a really great job of just reading the RF tag. And then I can look at the NDEF record on the tag, and it's my contact oh, details. So this is your. So this right here is just your V card. Yeah, it's just V card data put into NDEF record, stored on the tag. And uh, you know, if your phone had a, you know, if I spent enough time, it would read, and then uh, you'd have my contact details. And as we learned from Black Hat and DEF CON, it's really you could also open a browser page to a exploit, or have you thought about like maybe there's a buffer overflow that you could have in your hand. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is a um, there's a guy that I met um, at uh, in Australia at the IEE event, and uh, his name is Dr. Mark Gasson, and he he was the guy that um, that kind of proved that it was possible to propagate a vulnerability through RFID, um, and really it was a simple like SQL injection type attack, but it illustrated that you could kind of carry a virus or a vulnerability around uh, on tags, and if you were advanced enough, you could program through that vulnerability exploit, you could program the, the system to also carry forward that exploit on other tags that were presented to the system. So you could you could use your, your tag to introduce the vulnerability and then update the system so that every future tag presented would then carry it on to other systems. So in a business use case where the, the deployment is a common you know platform, if you find a vulnerability and it's commonly deployed, then you got a wide open attack vector. Wow. Uh, have, have you were you ever concerned doing this that like oh it's like you know it's like hard coding an application with des you know or or some lame crypto like that uh are you able to update the tags or are you stuck with whatever you put in there you know in in 40 years will you look back and be like dang it i don't even have that phone number why is my v card wrong yeah so the uh the the utility hand left hand um that tag is just read only it can't be changed it's just an id number that's unique from the factory and it really is kind of the tag that i use almost for everything and it's like a symmetric key it, yeah basically although i mean it's really simple like you know 40-bit number that's that's all it is i mean it's, um so uh on the right hand though like with this new you know high frequency tag it has one one kilobyte 
of storage space. They make four kilobyte and sixteen kilobyte oh. uh, storage as well. Although you know the, the I don't think the sixteen K will shrink the form factor down enough. I don't know. I have to investigate. But. Take that PDP eleven. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know I can totally update it. There are some some um, security features so I can lock down memory blocks and kind of passcode it. Um, you know, and for a normal tag where it was like a card in my wallet. That might be a problem because the, the those uh, algorithms have been cracked already. Um, the people work on them as soon as they come out, really, and so the the tags algorithms have been cracked. But it does take a little bit of time. So um, in you know in the case of my hand, that that exposure time is very limited because it's such a small read range, and I have to get right on. You know, I have to present my hand to the reader typically. So if it's in a wallet, somebody can kind of put a bag next to, and then the card's antenna is huge, so the range can be you know manipulated. Um, whereas in this case, it's really a short, you know, a period of time, a short window to try to attack the tag. Um, and then there's other issues like I could have a rotating one-time use key that's put in there that, you know, I could also monitor the reader. So I say, oh, well, the last time you were here, it looks like you've used it, you know, you've used it in between and I don't have a record of that use. And so then you can alert and make other kinds of arrangements. So all of that is done without a battery or anything? Yeah, it's totally passive, which is kind of cool. I mean... I'll probably, you know, turn to dust in the coffin and this thing will still be there. So um, it's a, no, yeah, no battery. You don't have to replace it. It's basically just an IC with a, a coil, you know, copper antenna. And it works more or less like a, a air core transformer. So I'm not familiar with that technology. Is that like induction charging? Yeah, it's, it's very similar. So, um, you know, the reader creates a magnetic field. Uh, you bring the tag within that field and the coil antenna will in induct power from it. And then the tag communicates with the reader by pulling more or less power modulating that field. And the reader can sense those power fluctuations and it's, you know, it's data. So it says, oh, okay, and the, da the tag can communicate its ID or whatever, you know, start. So it's only powered when it's being read. Yeah, otherwise it's completely inert. There's nothing going on. Um, which is, you know, it's great. So people are concerned sometimes about, um, there's been concerns over, you know, cancer issues and things like that. And, um, you know, you get way more exposure just carrying your cell phone around, uh, you know, electronic, you know, radiation type exposure. Um, other issues, you know, uh, people have been concerned about, you know, cancer uh, because there was some reports that came out. Uh, there was people doing studies on, uh, on toxicology and some of their animals were getting these tumors uh, around the implant site for the pet chips, right? Those animal tracking tags. And um, those, the thing that people need to understand is a couple things. One, those animals are predisposed to get cancer. Um, they're supposed to get cancer. They're doing, you know, um, carcinogen studies and toxicology studies. Um, the other thing is that uh, any chip that's meant for implantation in the body, uh, that's actually designed for implantation, is uh, it has this biobond type uh, porous coating. So that coating, uh, your body grows into that coating and locks the the tag in place. So it's kind of an irritant to the body. And um, and yeah, I would think that the the body would try to push it out, like expel it. Well, it's not. It doesn't see it as necessarily a foreign uh, invader type thing, but um, it, it it does you know kind of cause the cellular structure around the implant to kind of mutate into these little pores and stuff. Not mutate, but you know kind of have to work into this porous um, you know framework or structure. So uh, so it's kind of like if I get like a bolt in my knee. Sort of, yeah. Uh, only it's not reactive with the body. The body doesn't try to reject it. But this this coating. Um, Really, I mean, there's no records that I can see anyway of, of um, you know, healthy animals getting any kind of cancerous growth around any of the implants that uh, people people can get the bear chip, the FDA approved. It also has this coating, uh, or animals, you know, that are pets. Now, there's some like old pets, like old dogs and things, where they do develop tumors in parts of the body and around this implant site. Um, my whole thing, you know, reeling it back is, you know, the tags that I want to use are not designed for implantation. Um, they use the same glass as the implanted ones, uh, but they don't have that coating. So, um, you know, I'm, I have no fear at all of, of, about that being a you know, complication in the future. And so what are you doing here at Tor Camp? Um, well, actually, I, I won a ticket uh, here through GeekWire, which is great. And then, uh, you know, I decided I was talking to, you know, David, the organizer, and I said, well, what can I do to kind of help out? And so he's like, do you got anything you can talk about or anything? Like, I don't know. I could do some implantations. Like, we could just set up an <laughs> implantation station, right? So uh, he says, yeah, great. So I brought a bunch of, you know, gauze and iodine and, and gloves and, and uh, some tags. So EM4102 tags, 2 millimeter by 12 millimeter. And I have some readers that uh, people can use if they want to buy and kind of set up a little access control thing. Is it easy to implant? 
it's pretty easy. The two by 12 millimeter size goes right into the pet injector type uh, kit. So it's a syringe with a needle and a little plunger that pushes the tag out. So you just take that uh, injection kit, push the plunger, get rid of the animal tag because um, it's kind of a proprietary thing. There's not a lot of gear for it. Put the uh, you know put the other EM4102 in, and then you know hold your breath and chew. So is it like getting your ears pierced or something? Yeah, maybe maybe a little bit slower than that because uh, we have to you know go in carefully and push the thing out and then pull it out. But it really, it's the it's the uh, you know the the incision really that the needle makes that's the painful part. And then you push the plunger and then pull it out. And uh, you know we can't use any kind of anesthesiology or you know numbing agents uh, or anything like that. So you know I just do ice, so ice it for a couple minutes, numb it out, and then. Pew. Wow! And is there like a standard place to get injected? Um, there's, there's, there isn't. People want to get kind of injections every or implants in different weird places. But um, when I first got mine, nobody really done it. So uh, I really considered all the options, and I chose a place between the index finger and the thumb, that webbing area. Um, there's a radial and median nerve that go, you know, kind of split off at the wrist and go around that area. Uh, that area is also great because it's in the hand, and the low read range, you know, an inch or two at most is. It, you really, ha it's a consensual process. If I want to you know, have my tag read, I have to present it to a reader. Um, the FDA approved Verichip kind of thing, they go in the bicep and the tricep area, but that application is a reader to tag type scenario. Um, whereas, you know, anything that I build, I'm going to be putting the tag up to the reader. So the hand makes perfect sense for that because uh, it's easily manipulated. And then, um, you know, as far as like, you know, blunt force protection, I mean, it's a, it's a really kind of a, a squishy, for lack of a better word, squishy area. Uh, in the in the hand, so uh, people have done it in other places, and I, you know, I, I don't like that. It's up against bone. You could pinch it. You could crush the tag, um, broken glass, and ew, it's not good. So this, you know, I've had it since 2005. I've had this one, you know, or something in this hand since uh, same, you know, a couple months later. So um, yeah, I, I haven't had any problems with it. And I've smashed my hand pretty good. So I thought for sure I was like, oh crap, but no, nope, still still going. So that's awesome. Where can people find your site and read more about this animal? Uh, it's amal.net. I have a blog, uh, amal.net, and then um, I also wrote a book uh, a while back, and I set up a user forum for people to ask questions. So rfidtoys.com. I recently got the .com. So nice. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, that's you can ask questions there, and I'll answer. Dude, thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Really appreciate it. All right. You guys have probably heard me gushing about Ting over the last couple of months and I'm so happy to hear that a lot of Hack5 viewers have already taken advantage of their customer first approach to the cell market. You see, Ting is a new service that brings clarity, usability, and big savings to mobile phone users. What I love about Ting is they're very simple offering their honest pricing, basically minutes, megabytes, and text messages, all of those build separately. So if you use more than you just pay for the next tier, there's no ridiculous fees. And if you use less, then you credit it. So there's no BS. Check it out, ting.com slash hack5, and check out their online savings calculator. And if you're ready to get started, get this, you'll get an extra $75 off your first month of service just for being a Hack5 viewer. Check it out at ting.com slash hak5.